gracias, muchas gracias por invitarme a Chile. Es un gran placer estar aquí con vosotros para hablar sobre prosperidad. ¿Qué es exactamente la prosperidad? Esa es mi pregunta central. Lo siento, no, no voy a hablar todo el tiempo en español. It's better if I speak a little, for me at least, in English. What is prosperity? That is my central question. And in particular, what can prosperity possibly mean on a finite planet with finite resources and fragile ecological limits? Um, it's a question that unfortunately perhaps we have to become economists to answer a little bit. In particular because the conventional view of what, e what prosperity means is something to do with economic growth, that we must expand our economy um, in order to achieve a greater prosperity. Um, but as uh, some of the economists have recognized, in fact, um, the person who said this was an economist, anyone who thinks that um, exponential growth is possible on a finite planet is either a madman or an economist. Um, we have to delve nonetheless in the detail, a little bit of the detail of the economy to understand how we can get beyond this idea that prosperity depends primarily, indeed to some people solely, on increasing economic output. In a fragile planet with limited resources, it doesn't really stack up. So what is our process into that? I'm going to try and lead you through a little bit of the complication of the economy. Now, here it is. It's happening before me. I'm not pressing anything. Uh, this is, if you like, the beginnings of an understanding of what the economy looks like. And you can see that it involves people, it involves firms, it involves uh, trade between countries, it involves investment and saving. It's a complicated terminology. It seems a long way away from the environment, and it seems a long way away from the question of um, uh, economic um, prosperity, of our quality of life. Um, but if you turn things around, you can always see things slightly differently. And my justification for talking about economics is really this, the purpose of studying economics, said a, another economist back in the 1950s, is not to acquire a set of ready-made answers, um, but to avoid being deceived by economists. And that seems like a good task. That was Joan Robinson in the 1950s. And so I want to concentrate on one little bit of this particular um, diagram, which is the, what's called labor productivity, which is how efficient we are using people's time to produce the goods and services that should lead us towards prosperity. The trouble is that this is a more and more difficult thing to achieve. So this is a picture of labor productivity in my country, and what you can see here is the rise and rise of labor productivity until the mid-1960s, and then it's steady decline since the mid-1960s. Many people think that the reason why we're not getting the growth that we would like in the economy at the moment is because of the financial crisis. But the financial crisis actually is uh, somewhere, if I can use the laser pointer to show you, is somewhere down the bottom of this curve. It's not really showing up very much, but you can see that the financial crisis is right at the end of this descent. The economy is already slowing down in a country like mine. I want to, I want to relate this in a minute to stories, and, and really the story partly of my country and partly of Chile. So it's worth asking, of course, you know, what happens when you're trying to chase growth in order to deliver prosperity in an economy that's slowing down, where labor productivity is slowing down in this way. And, and actually, it's a rather unfortunate story, because as you chase labor productivity and protect the returns to capital and try to make sure that all your asset owners are being paid what they would like to see from the ownership of their assets, you suppress the wages of ordinary people, you withdraw social spending, and you begin to create a horrible inequality. And you do this quite often 
by on the way creating debt, debt to households, debt to firms, and a form of debt in the speculation on assets and property, on resources that drives up resource prices and increases that inequality. Here's a picture, and again, apologies for the complication of the picture, it's a, a picture of the failure of what has been called trickle-down economics. The idea that growth can give us prosperity depends on the idea that as the rich get richer and the economy grows, that wealth will trickle down to the poorest. What this graph here shows is that that used to work. So if you look at the blue line, this was what growth looked like across different income percentiles. So the poorest people are on the left-hand side of my graph, the richest people are on the right. And what the blue line says, essentially, is that up until about 1980, as we grew our economies, the poor got richer. They did better out of growth than the rich did. Look at that, 6% growth for the bottom, the poorest 1% of the population up to about the 1980s. And then after the 1980s, as productivity growth was slowing down, the situation is reversed. And we have a deeply uncomfortable situation in which now the top 0.0001% of the population have a growth in their incomes which is much higher than the average growth, and the poorest have actually negative growth. Look at that, can you believe that? Less than 0% growth out of all the growth that we've had over the last 30 or 40 years. That's the system gone wrong. It was called trickle-down economics. It was a kind of a trick, really. It was a magic potion that people were given in order to believe that things would get better if they drunk it, and guess what? It shrunk their incomes. As every hunted animal knows, it's not how fast you run that counts, but whether you're slower than anyone else. And those who get left behind actually get left behind an incredibly important race because it's about prosperity. And what we created, and I'm really telling really now the story of, of advanced countries, of my nation in particular, this fire came after the financial crisis as the result of riots in London because of the conditions of what was called austerity, our response to the financial crisis. And we therefore created a kind of economy that doesn't work at all, an economy in which we see enterprise as accumulation, investment as speculation, money as a form of power, and work as a form of servitude. It's an economy in which we have privatized gains and socialized the losses associated with the economy. So that's the hard part in a way over. That's the economics of a situation that has turned out to be dysfunctional. Is it so bad in Chile, for example? Is that actually what we're looking at in Chile? And, and this is news, actually, from yesterday, reported uh, that the labor productivity growth in Chile fell by 0.7%. And here is a trend uh, of labor productivity growth in Chile, which tells you, actually, that there's the same sort of decline going on in labor productivity growth in Chile. And according to the OECD, El modelo chileno requiere de una actualización para continuar teniendo éxito. The Chilean economy must have an, be updated if it is to continue to be successful. Now, the question that I really want to pose to you is whether that is something we should accept or not. And it may be a difficult question for you to answer, having just seen complicated economic diagrams, the importance of a term like labor productivity, and someone giving you a little bit too much theory at this point in time. But I want to pose to you the possibility, actually, that this slowing down of productivity is not such a bad thing. And how will I do that? I want to, at this point, make it very personal and, and tell you a little bit about my journey here. A story of someone arriving from this broken economy into a different continent, a different land. It was minus 
two degrees in London. I arrived, it was 30 degrees in Chile. And I was driven straight to uh, Talca to do a presentation there. And on the way, I was speaking to the taxi driver, and I suddenly received a phone call. Now, growth is not all bad. It has given us some amazing technologies. So I am able to talk to the carers of my ailing mother in the southwest of England at the same time as I'm being driven to Talca to give a talk about prosperity. And it was a, a, a routine conversation about the nature of her care and the state of her life. And um, I felt I should apologize, though, to the taxi driver because it had interrupted our conversation. So I explained that this was my 86-year-old um, mother and that I had to take care of some issues regarding her health. And he said, 86, she's just a youngster. My mother's 94. She lives in the countryside in Chile, and she's doing very well, thank you. She has a wonderful life and enjoys her family. And I was reminded, actually, that's exactly the point about this comparison between prosperity and economic growth. So if I can explain to you, it sits, that story sits exactly on this graph. So here is Chile, life expectancy is over 80, with an income of, average income of, it's a little bit higher now, but this is ancient dollars of around 10 to 15 thousand dollars. Here is my country, if we can see it. Um, the UK, yep, and here is the USA. So much higher income levels, but not such a high life expectancy. So it, that's a little bit perverse, isn't it? Don't you think if, if growth, income is supposed to give us prosperity, and yet actually people have longer, happier, healthier lives in Chile than they do in my country or in advanced nations? So that's a point actually where we may be asking is this decline in labor productivity such a bad thing? One of the things that the OECD points to, actually, in Chile, is this idea that outside of the mining sector, most people are working in jobs which are less and less productive. Why is that? Because they are making artisanal products, for example, which take a lot of time to make them, or because they're working in the care sector, where actually what matters is the time that we give to each other as carers, or because they're in education, where they're taking the trouble actually to serve the needs of a younger generation and to lead them towards a future. Another very important reason why a declining labor productivity growth may not be such a bad thing, and it's to do with employment. So here in these final few minutes of the presentation, what I want to do is to sketch out for you the possibility that we could take that dysfunctional economy and turn it inside out. We could take each of those things, enterprise, investment, money, work, and say, actually, we would like to have an economy in which these things matter again in a strong way. And um, work is a perfect example. So here is the future of work, if you believe the mainstream dialogue. A driverless car is the perfect vehicle to take me to the unemployment office. Um, and this threat, actually, that technology will deprive people of labor is an incredibly important one. It's one that's being driven by the idea that labor productivity growth is everything. It's being driven by the idea that growth is everything. And, and we have a choice, actually, a really important choice, to ask ourselves, how, at this point, do we approach that question of labor productivity? Do we buy the story from the OEC that the big but, el gran pero de Chile, is the low productivity? Or do we actually accept that lower productivity may be a good thing? Do we, in pursuit of productivity, chase driverless cars, robots in our factories, the technologization of everything? Or do we begin to say prosperity actually is about the quality of our lives, and the kind of work we do there matters. Now, here are some of the advantages of low productivity growth. Low productivity growth is the same thing as employment richness. There are more jobs when lower productivity growth is in the economy. Um, there's a sector which we might very well want to focus on, social and personal services, 
And uh, what you can see here on my graph is that the employment intensity of that sector is very high. An economist would look at that and say, that means labor productivity is bad. We can look at it and say, that means employment is good. We can say another thing as well. If you can understand the graph, the vertical axis is talking about carbon dioxide, one of the most important elements in the greenhouse effect. And that sector of services, low productivity services, is the lowest sector in relation to greenhouse gases. In other words, we can say there's something in this idea that um, work matters in these sectors. And I would argue to you that work is an essential part of prosperity, actually, because work is about participating in society. Work should be bringing us a sense of meaning and purpose. And in many professions which are related to care and craft, and creativity, that's exactly what it's doing. It's bringing a meaning to people's lives, an identity to people's lives that matters to them and is an integral part of prosperity. In many cases and in many countries, of course, things are rather different. Um, there was 50 to 60% youth unemployment in southern Europe after the crisis, and that is not just a bad economic fact. It's a tragedy of un explored potential in half a generation of people. And it's also caused political instability. To some extent, you can look at events that have happened in North America and indeed events that have happened in my own country, political instability that is beginning to undermine the fabric of our prosperity. But if we turn that on its head, if we thought about work actually as an integral part of what we're doing, could we not change the way we think about economics. Enterprise. Uh, an, an, an enterprise actually could be about service. We could think of enterprise as being the task of delivering the things that we need for people to prosper, rather than simply digging materials up out of the ground, creating material products, consuming them at ever-increasing rates, and throwing them away again. You can see what I'm doing here. I'm trying to revise all of those bits of the economy. Investment. Investment became a kind of gambling casino. It became a form of speculation. My argument to you is that investment is critically important because it is our commitment towards the future. It is our way of saying we're going to set aside some resources now so that we can invest in our children's health and well-being into the future. All of these things are possible. I work with a lot of the people who are trying to do this exactly at the moment. One of the things they will say at the very beginning is it's very difficult to achieve this um, if you have a dysfunctional money system. Now, it's a complicated thing to talk about the money system. Most people think that money either comes out of a hole in the wall or that governments somehow create it. The reality is somewhat different, that 90% of our money is created by banks who charge everyone interest for borrowing their money, including the government. So that when the government actually is faced with austerity, tries to cut its budget, it can no longer invest in the education and health of the nation, but it's still paying interest to some of the richest people in society. No wonder we created such inequality. So where am I going with this? I'm trying to suggest that we can build, instead of this dysfunctional economy, an economy that works for everyone, an economy of care and craft and creativity, an economy in which it's possible to answer that question about prosperity in a different way. And if you think this is just Tim Jackson, a radical economist from another country, uh, coming late in the day, um, just take a look at this little quote, because this is the quote from a man who first devised economic theory, John Stuart Mill. I'm not charmed with this life, where the normal state of human beings is that of struggling to get on, trampling, crushing, elbowing. The best state of human nature, said John Stuart Mill, is one in which, while no one is poor, no one desires to be richer, nor has any reason to fear being thrust back by this competitive struggle all the time, a different sense of prosperity. Now, if John Stuart Mill had said, this is the most likely state of human nature, you would have said, 
no, sorry, mate, you don't understand human nature that well. But he didn't. He said, actually, this is the best state of human nature. Economics as it is encourages us to be selfish, novelty-seeking hedonists. But that's not human nature either. Actually, we care as much about other people as we do about ourselves. We care as much about tradition as we do about novelty. And that's a very different way of thinking about economics. It's a different way of thinking about prosperity. It's the idea, in fact, that um, prosperity is something that is about people. It's about life. It's about well-being. It's about our sense of living within limits, but doing so in a way that includes each other. It's about having meaning and purpose in life. Prosperity, at the end of the day, transcends those material concerns, and it's about the quality of our being. The story of me coming to Chile and having that conversation with the taxi driver and understanding that life expectancy matters and understanding that there are reasons why an economy can either choose to deliver that or run away from it, chasing productivity. That's the story that I want to leave you with. The idea that Chile, in some sense, at this point in time, sits at a kind of sweet spot where development has achieved this fantastic life expectancy and reduced inequality in some places and improved quality of life and has a choice to make, whether it follows the neoliberal hyper-capitalism that's going to destroy the planet and make us more unequal, or settle on a vision of prosperity that works. Our ability to flourish as human beings on a finite planet. Thank you very much.